So that's where you're seeing a lot of pressure, downward pressure on the economy, downward pressure on prices, because the natural gravitation, natural gravitational forces are for prices to fall. That's the natural state of thing, the state of affairs. You it takes a lot of monetary fuel pushing into the market to, to keep these prices afloat. But if the bank lending isn't there and the consumer doesn't want to borrow and corporations are saturated in, in debt, and they are, then um, I don't think you're going to have much of a, a mollifying effect from a handful of rate cuts that are going to happen between now and say the middle of 25. So it's not so much that we have to end this system as we have to end the inflationary part of the system in return to gold, which still is on the Fed's balance sheet. It's still there. It's only about 8% of the dollar now. But it, assuming assuming there's gold in Fort Knox, which I assume there is, and I can't prove that, but uh, it's still this is still a hangover from a gold dollar that's heavily inflated and with much of its value blown up literally in the bombs that are falling on my town. From the way, th how far the way through uh, the bull market we are, uh, my experience has been that when the just when the generalist investor buys into the precious metals narrative, that's when silver leads. Uh, until then, when it's still a fear market, gold leads. Uh, the point of all this is don't, again, buy into the silver market with a short-term narrative. It's not a short-term trade. The spark hasn't been lit underneath silver or silver stocks. You do it with uncertain timing because the rewards for success are so incredible. As Doug Casey points out, in today's special compilation, we've gathered insights from three renowned experts in the precious metals market, Rafi Farber, Michael Pento, and Rick Rule. They dive deep into the current state of gold and silver, discussing the potential implications of upcoming interest rate cuts and how these shifts could impact your investments in precious metals. We've spent hours watching and analyzing footage so you don't have to uh, bringing together the most critical and actionable insights from these experts. You'll hear their thoughts on how macroeconomic changes are evolving and what strategies they're employing to maximize returns in their gold and silver holdings during these uncertain times. If you're serious about understanding the future of precious metals and how to protect and grow your wealth, this compilation of clips is a must watch. But first, smash the subscribe button, turn on notifications, and hit the like button to keep us motivated to do the recaps. Enjoy the episode. I think there's going to be one, you know, March 2020 style pullback, and that's a pullback in dollar terms. It's not a pullback in commodity terms, um, which you saw in 2020 was uh, if you compare gold to commodities versus uh, gold versus other commodities. The all time high was in March 2020 when gold hit 1450 and, and really and that's when the mining stocks were like, you know, really tanking and, and, and people's portfolios, including my own, that is heavy on mining stocks, really took a, a crazy beating and we were having heart palpitations. And that could happen again because there's going to be one more deflationary crash when it could be when the reverse repos run out or shortly after that. And we're going to have banking crises all over. And then it's going to take the Fed some amount of time, not much time to come in and say, OK, we'll print six, seven trillion dollars and then start doing it. But in it, up to the time when they actually decide to do that or actually start doing it, gold is probably going to fall in dollar terms. And that's a I'm not I'm not suggesting that anyone sell it now and then buy it at that dip and, and then, uh, you know, trade it. You could. But to imagine that you'll be able to and without panicking and time it just right. That's uh, it's a little hubris, hubristic if you're going to try to do that. Maybe you could do it with a small with, you know, with a small amount of your, your capital. But I, I wouldn't I wouldn't try to do that and sell all your gold now and then buy it back at that point. Um, it's just it's much safer just to keep in mind that it's probably going to happen because before <clears throat> hyperinflation is really a struggle between hyperdeflation and the central bank. It, it, exiting uh, trying to exit that which which forces the liquidation of all the debt and the end of the banking system which is going to happen hyper in, in the hyperinflationary path instead but they they put it off in time uh 
with the hyper with with the inflationary strategy. The question really is: Is the next printing round going to be the the end and the hyperinflation, the end of the dollar? Uh, and I think it will be, uh, because just globally we're we're on the precipice of a nuclear war. It seems. And and Ukraine has now invaded Russia. They they're invading a nuclear power. Putin could start dropping bombs whenever he wants. I don't know if he will. And uh, I think he knows that if he does, uh, the planet could be destroyed. So maybe he won't. But you know, at some point, who knows what he's going to do? I mean, a nuclear power is being invaded by Ukraine now with American weapons. This doesn't seem safe. So uh, in terms of what you said. The best thing to do is to to buy gold and silver. Yes, it's not just about protecting your family and your wealth. That's an effect of it. It's it's a positive effect, but the the point of doing that is to hasten the end and to get it coming as soon as possible. Uh, because once the definition of a dead dollar is a dollar that can no longer be exchanged for gold and silver at all, and you do that. By buying gold, right? By raising the exchange rate between the dollar and gold, so we want to see it just keep going up and up and up and up, not because we want to have so many dollars in our portfolios that we can count and imagine how much we can buy with them, because in the end the dollar isn't going to be worth anything, and you're going to be stuck with your ounces. And the ounces that you have will be able to buy the most during the end game because the end game means. That you, that the 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 amount of monetary of liquidity, real liquidity in the system is so low that prices in terms of that liquidity become so so high that that you can buy enormous amounts with even silver, uh, with even a few coins of silver. So that's what that's what we're looking at. We're really looking. Silver is going to be the ultimate bell ring at the end of this. Uh, we're looking for a fifteen to one ratio, which is the natural monetary ratio. And once that returns, that means that the that derivatives of gold and silver no longer work at all, which is why the 15 to 1 ratio returns. As the global economy navigates turbulent waters, gold is emerging as a safe haven for investors. With rising concerns over inflation and potential economic downturns, the precious metal has recently surged past $2,500, reaching new all-time highs. Michael Pento of Pento Portfolio Strategies emphasizes that gold thrives in environments where real interest rates are negative and nominal rates are declining. This is precisely the the scenario we find ourselves in, with the Federal Reserve hinting at potential rate cuts to manage a slowing economy. While gold is gaining favor, silver's outlook remains more ambiguous. Pento notes that silver, which carries both industrial and monetary components, performs best in a globally reflationary environment, one that is currently absent. The global economy's lack of momentum and the absence of significant industrial demand leaves silver in a more precarious position compared to its glittering counterpart. The broader economic landscape is fraught with risk as Pento highlights the existence of three concurrent bubbles in housing, equities, and bonds. These bubbles, now larger than any seen in previous economic cycles, pose a significant threat to financial stability. Despite some disinflationary trends, inflation continues to erode the purchasing power of the middle and lower classes, with essential goods remaining unaffordable for many. Now, we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview, but first, smash the subscribe button, hit the like button, and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. Gold loves negative real interest rates and falling nominal interest rates. That's exactly what we're exactly where we are. So um, it, what gold hates, what gold gets killed in, that's the environment is what I would call sector four of my portfolio. The, the sectors go from deflation, disinflation, stasis, reflation, and then stagflation or, or hyperinflation. Um, sector four is when you have a, a relatively healthy economy in the context of rising nominal rates, which happens in reflation. Well, we don't have that now. What we have is the Federal Reserve who is <laughs> telling you that, hey, we're we're ready to start cutting interest rates. Here we go. We're going to start cutting rates. We're going to be cutting rates for the next year or two. 
We're going to take them down to around 3% from five and a quarter to five and a third. Effective Fed funds rate is 5.3%. And that's the direction of, of travel for interest rates. So nominal rates are going to be falling. And if they're falling in a context where we don't have deflation, because remember, gold does not like, does not like liquidity crises or, or, a, or a sharp deflation. Gold really likes disinflation. Um, so uh, I always start with 5% physical gold in your possession, and then you toggle your investment portfolio of what I call liquid paper gold between zero and 20. We are at 10% right now in that very um, liquid, uh, I call it, like I said, liquid paper gold. So think of that like either ETFs or even the gold miners. But in, in an environment where you're headed into possibly disinflation to deflation, you should be very wary of miners because miners are stocks and stocks usually get killed in deflation. So just be careful of that. I, I, I me personally, I like silver when we have a global reflation occurring. And I, I just don't see that right now. So you want, you want to see the global economy starting to boom. So this, cause, cause silver has an industrial component and a monetary component. So you want to see global growth accelerate. So demand for silver would be strong in the context of some reflation. I, I don't see that right now. I just don't see it. And remember what I remember what I said, the fed can control short-term interest rates. They don't control long-term interest rates. And if you look at the fact that we've had real positive Fed funds right now for well over 12, 12 months, so it's well over a year, and they're positive by 2% plus, that seems to be the, that's when you see, that, that's when historically things get really ugly um, in, in the money markets and in the economy. So I'm monitoring the situation. The odds are very high for, for a, a very chaotic period uh, to occur. The time is just not it's just not yet. In today's news recap, Samsung silver battery revolution, faster, longer range, cheaper. A groundbreaking new report from the Silver Academy has unveiled the potential of Samsung silver solid state batteries to revolutionize the transportation industry and drive a significant increase in demand for silver. The report estimates that the widespread adoption of this technology could lead to a surge in silver prices and reshape the global silver market. Samsung's silver solid state battery technology offers several advantages over traditional lithium ion batteries. Reduced weight, simplified material requirements, potential for lower costs as production scales up. The applications of silver solid state batteries extend beyond passenger vehicles. The adoption of silver solid state batteries across various transportation sectors, including cars, trucks, buses, vans, ships, barges, ferries, yachts, and airplanes, could create a massive demand for silver. The report estimates that the annual silver demand could increase by up to 25,400 metric tons if a significant portion of these vehicles adopt this technology. Such a significant increase in silver demand could have profound implications for the silver market. Rising prices, silver prices are likely to experience a substantial increase as demand outpaces supply. Increased mining activity, the silver mining industry would need to expand to meet the growing demand, leading to increased investment and job creation. Recycling opportunities, recycling silver from decommissioned batteries could become a crucial crucial industry to support the sustainable use of this resource. The current annual global silver production is approximately 25,000 metric tons. If the estimated increase in demand due to the adoption of silver solid state batteries materializes, it could represent a 101% increase in silver production. This would put significant strain on the existing mining infrastructure and potentially drive up silver prices. Samsung's silver solid state battery technology has the potential to transform the transportation industry and drive a significant increase in demand for silver. 
as the world transitions to electric vehicles and other forms of sustainable transportation, the silver market is poised for a period of growth and opportunity. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview, but first smash the subscribe button, hit the like button and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. Names include Agnico Eagle, although it's had a hell of a run. Uh, it's worthy to note <clears throat> that unlike the big two miners concentrated in Nevada, they're concentrated now in Northern Ontario. But if you look at their reserves and resources on a 100% owned basis, rather than the 42% owned by Newmont or the 58 or whatever it is percent owned by Barrick, the equivalent ounces are the same. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I, I'm attracted to Agnico Eagle. You may know that uh, I had Sean Boyd uh, at my Natural Resources Investment Symposium in Boca Raton. I had the uh, great pleasure of having him for lunch uh, and really got to get in his head about how he built Agnico Eagle and how he continues to function as chairman now that he's not no longer CEO. So I would consider that the bellwether operator. Uh, Endeavor Mining in Africa has sold off like a boulder off a bridge after thanking and excusing their CEO uh, for financial improprieties. It doesn't change their status as a low-cost producer nor does it change their development pipeline, although there is some concern that some of the operating management left to go to a new company, Lundin backed, called Montage. But I would look at Endeavor for people who have the courage, the political courage to operate in West Africa. But people really need to focus on the highest quality names. And I would say the highest quality names are uh, respectively Franco Nevada and Wheaton. Franco is particularly attractive because it's underperformed. It has underperformed because an asset which was 14% of net asset value, the Panamanian asset, was at least temporarily nationalized. The arithmetic around this from Franco uh, shareholders' point of view is interesting. The stock declined 42% because 14% of net asset value went away. It shows you that most speculators are very, very, very bad at arithmetic. So I think that's a reasonable smattering uh, of names uh, that people can look at. Coming down the quality trail a little bit, I think if you sell, if you see any big sell-offs in G Mining, now that they've acquired Reunion, that that would be worth looking at. A lot of Reunion shareholders own the stock because it would be taken over. Now that it's been taken over, they have no continuing reason to own the stock. But the truth is that building out that deposit by the G Mining team, the best qualified team in the world to build it, will ultimately develop into a multi-asset gold mining company, which will be higher priced. Uh, if the share price of G mining doesn't respond, I suspect that you'll see G mining itself be taken over. My hope would be by Lundin Gold. Understand the Lundins don't listen to me particularly with regards to things like this. Coming down the quality trail again, probably getting to your question. G2 mining, which is across the property boundary uh, from Reunion, has to be taken over. Uh, you know, Goldfields is a shareholder there, probably because they want to participate ultimately in the consolidation of that district, but it has to be taken over. Uh, so I think that's something that's worth looking at. It might not happen for two years or three years. And people who are going to have trauma holding stock into the fall would be well advised not to consider that name. Another speculative name I like a lot is Snowline, uh, sold off a lot because of the pit failure, or pardon me, the, the uh, uh, heat failure uh, in uh, the Yukon. Uh, the idea that an advanced exploration stage project uh, sells off because of a temporary hiatus in permitting in the Yukon is hugely amusing to me. Uh, this is likely a 10 million ounce plus deposit, very good grade. Yes, there are challenges. It is in the middle of nowhere. But the exploration upside hasn't been uh, factored in. So provided, Jesse, that your uh, listeners do what you instructed, which is to say have a speculative bent and are willing to do the work, those are some names that I think are more likely than not to work. What do you think of their takes? Do you agree with the experts? Post in the comments section down below your honest opinion and share with us if you're getting ready for a massive recession that will shock the markets and make the precious metals shine, or if on the contrary, 
you think America will be just fine, and there's no need to worry that much since we're the most important country in the world and we'll come out winning as usual. Now watch this video right here because it's a perfect fit for you. I'll see you on the other side.